Later. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Kathy Trafton, a member of the UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Today's presentation, Good Bugs, Bad Bugs on Edible Plants, is the fifth in our spring edible series. Today, the focus is on encouraging the good bugs to work for you, saving time and money wasted treating your garden with unnecessary insecticides and keeping your home and garden healthy. We'll help you learn to identify the most common and destructive pests on edible plants, to identify beneficial insects that will help your edible garden thrive, and to invite the good bugs into your garden and safely send the bad bugs packing on their way. The basics of integrated pest management, that's IPM for short, and finally, where to find science-based and healthy solutions for your garden pest problems. Today, we have two co-presenters. That would be Eliana Bushwalter and Sharon Winnicky. Eliana loves working in the garden and volunteering with the UC Master Gardeners when she's not traveling and hiking in our national parks. She grew up with a love of the outdoors and is the daughter of an entomologist whose life work focused on integrated pest management and biological control. Eliana developed a love of insects and the role they play in our natural world. Sharon Winnicky has been a volunteer UC Master Gardener since 2010 and has been active in the establishment of the UC Master Gardener Education Center speaker series. Interested in integrated pest management, Sharon attended the UC statewide IPM programs advanced IPM workshop for Master Gardeners in 2016. Her own gardener garden features oak trees and shade plants, edibles, container gardens, and succulents. During today's presentation, if you have any questions, please use the chat box. Start with the name of your city before typing your question. And after the presentation, our chat manager is going to voice the questions for Eliana and Sharon to answer. And if your questions aren't answered, please bring them to our Master Gardeners helpline. The link is in our chat box and also will be on the website where you registered. You can find a copy of the presentation and the video on our UC Master Gardener website in the next few days. Eliana and Sharon, on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you everybody for allowing us to be a part of this Friday afternoon. So, good, good bugs and bad bugs in our edible gardens. Um, as Kathy already mentioned, we hope that um, in this session, we'll be able to share with you a little bit about some of the beneficial insects and good bugs, and then also um, talk a little bit about the bad bugs and the pests that they love, um, but we don't. <laughs> and uh, also to talk a little bit uh, about integrated pest management, what that means, what biological control means, um, give you some a few garden tactics that will help uh, encourage those beneficial bugs. Um, and then also we have a lot of resources of which we won't go into all of the details, but they will be a part of this presentation. So they'll be available to all of you to uh, avail yourselves of them. Okay, next slide, please. So we're actually gonna start with the uh, bad bugs. Um, and uh, there are many, um, and we're gonna highlight the most common ones. It's certainly not an exhaustive list. So we're gonna, we're gonna hit the highlights of the ones that you probably see the most often in your garden. Aphids. Um, aphids are probably the most common pests that you see. Um, these, there are so many different species of aphids. Um, so they come in, in a variety of colors. They, they're, in, they're a soft-bodied um, insect. The um, immature ones uh, look very much like the adults. So they're very easy to identify. Um, and a lot of these species affect both edible and ornamental uh, plants. So you'll see them in a variety of settings. 
they're found mostly in dense groups, as you probably all very well know that you can find them on all sorts of parts of the plants in, in uh, very close quarters. Um, but they don't move really very rapidly, so it's kind of easy to manage them. Um, as I mentioned, they, they do uh, attack quite a few different uh, vegetables and um, ornamentals, as you can see here. Uh, they can produce a, a variety of different uh, problems on the plants. Uh, leaf curl, they produce a uh, honeydew, which can, can then produce a sooty uh, mold fung fungus. Uh, they can uh, stunt the growth of a plant. Um, and then if they go from plant to plant and you have one plant that's got a virus, they can transmit that virus to another plant. So managing and controlling them, um, they don't necessarily kill a mature plant, um, but they are unsightly and they do produce that honeydew. So uh, trying to manage them is, is probably best done in a couple of different ways. They do have uh, a, a, a partner in crime and that is ants um, that uh, get promoted by the fact that they produce this honeydew and those ants will uh, protect uh, those aphids so that um, then now you've got these two pests and we'll talk a little bit more about ants. The way that I try to manage them as best I can is to knock them off with a water stream, stream or to remove them by hand. Um, and, I, and I spend a lot of time in my garden walking around and looking for uh, the, these pests and try to manage them uh, before they get out of hand. And I was just out in the garden looking at my roses and sure enough, they're in the tiny little new rosebuds you see already a, a few little aphids. So just pick them off or take a very gentle stream of water and just take them off. Uh, since they have a partner in crime, which are the ants, there's other ways to manage um, aphids and that is to use a band of sticky material on the trunks of certain plants, it's called tanglefoot. And um, so that's one way and then the, the uh, last resort would be using insecticidal soap. Okay, uh, so ants. These are closely related to, to bees and wasps. They, uh, we are gonna talk a little bit just about the, how the ants affect your garden and not necessarily the ones that are invading your home. They are social insects. Um, and they go through a metamorphosis so that the, the um, juveniles will not look like the um, adults will. And they, they do like to be in colonies. And looking for and controlling ants um, and controlling aphids is kind of a, a double sorted thing. Um, maybe we can go on to the next slide. Sorry about that. Um, since they, since aphids produce um, the honeydew, then ants are attracted to it. Um, the honeydew is also produced by other insects, and so that's kind of the the uh, the challenge here is to make sure to try and and control these other pests, which can control the ants. Um, I know I've seen ants already on my yep. uh, roses. The, the, the aphids are there and the ants follow soon. Yep, they do. So then in terms of management and control of ants, we already mentioned the band of sticky material that can be used on the trunks of, of trees. Also, the other possibility is to try and eliminate as much of the food sources as you can uh, that attracts ants. We did include here a, a, a link to a video on how to use the tanglefoot and um, the ants and the aphid, kind of the, the relationship between the, the two of them. So uh, that is there for your reference. 
slugs and snails. So, so slugs and snails are not bugs, but we thought this is this is probably one of the most destructive pests in our garden. And so we wanted to feature them here as, as one that, that you want to try and control. Uh, they are mollusks, so they're similar in structure and biology, except that the slugs don't have an external shell. And they all lay eggs after mating. As snails take two years to mature, whereas slugs are around um, after six months. They frequently um, are in very damp conditions and in areas where there's a lot of garden debris. Um, they are most active at night, so you might see the trails of snails when you, when you get up in the morning um, after a rainy day or after a damp, uh, a damp situation. They damage a variety of plants, so you want to kind of keep an eye on these. They prefer the seedlings of, of the herbaceous plants and fruits, so um, these are pretty destructive critters. Managing and controlling them, it's, it's best to use um, a combination of methods here. Uh, I physically remove the snails by hand. Um, Sharon, you had told me that you kind of use a different technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remove them by hand, but you uh, kindly toss them. Uh. <laughs> yes, I do, I do. I have a tendency to toss them over the fence into the uh, wilds of the uh, un, un, uh, you know, undeveloped area behind my house. <laughs> and, and I tend to um, give them the old uh, stomp and crunch, them stomp under, and my, crunch. Under, my, under my boot. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that you, you may want to do is to look for areas where there's debris and the places where they hide and where they live. Uh, this, that's really important to keep your garden as, as clean as possible of that. Um, we, we also included a link to another video here that, that you may avail yourselves to, to see whether or not uh, the destruction that you're seeing in your garden is actually due to snails or something else. White flies. So white flies are uh, related to aphids and scales and mealybugs, but they're not really true flies. They're, they're little tiny, tiny guys and they, they lay all the eggs underneath the, the leaves. So again, here's another situation where you want to walk through your garden, look at your plants, really pay attention to what's going on in your garden, look under the leaves to see if you see effects of, of any pests and um, see if you can catch them before they get out of control. The damage they cause uh, can be uh, dramatic in that they have sucking mouth parts and so they'll, um, they can uh, desiccate the plants or, you know, dry them out and make them uh, not very sightly. And they also excrete the honeydew that is um, wonderful uh, you know, uh, attractants to ants. So they, there is a wide variety of um, edible plants that they are um, attracted to and that can damn it, that, that can be damaged by them. In terms of management and control, again, looking for them uh, so that they can uh, be uh, controlled before they kind of get out of hand is really important. They have several natural enemies, which Sharon will talk a little bit about. Um, so she'll tell you more about those um, wonderful insects that you that can be uh, good uh, uh, enemies to the white flies. Um, and again, you want to try and control them before they get out of hand. And large infestations of white flies actually means that you probably need to remove infested plants or materials um, from your garden so that they don't get onto other plants. Earwigs. Um, these little guys, I know, I don't know about you, but they're they're all over my garden. Um, I try to 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 manage them as best I can, but um, these are these are pretty popular. They they have these little appendages on the um, ends that they use as defense. Um, they are pretty active all year round in in our gardens. So these are these are 
critters that that you'll see a lot of. I know I do, and especially in my artichoke plants, they they seem to like them. Um, they will uh, attack some soft fruits and corn silk um, and chew holes. Um, they are moisture loving, and so this is this is one way that you might be able to manage and control them is to make sure that your garden isn't over irrigated, um, that you're controlling the amount of moisture that, and, and I guess that's part of the reason why they love my artichokes so much because, you know, that is a plant that, that is moisture loving and uh, tends to need a lot of water. Um, so consider, you know, managing the irrigation, consider adjusting moisture um, and eliminating the high hiding places. The one caveat about earwigs is they will eat aphids. And so um, this is a good bug, bad bug kind of situation where maybe managing the numbers is uh, more important than eradicating them completely. Tomato hornworms. Um, this is a, a worm that has a horn-like um, thing at the end of its body and it develops into a night flying moth. Um, they're very good at camouflage, camouflaging. Um, so sometimes it takes a lot of looking around and seeing whether they've got, whether they're a large, uh, they are super voracious um, eaters of tomato plants. Next slide. And, um, you know, I, I, I tend to hand pick them. And um, in my case, we have a um, rescue bearded dragon who absolutely loves um, tomato hornworms. And uh, I don't know if any of you real, uh, know this, but if you go to the Petco or any of the pet stores, tomato hornworms go for like five bucks a pop. And <laughs> so they're very expensive, but bearded mm -hmm. dragons love them very much. So I tend to be a little happy when I ha actually end up seeing one because then um, my bearded dragon gets a treat. But certainly they are such voracious eaters of tomato plants that you don't really want them around. So one way um, other than hand picking is to use um, Bacillus thuringiensis spray, which is um, a focused spray of bacteria uh, that can be used if your uh, tomato uh, plants uh, have an infestation. And again, Sharon, um, we'll share a little bit more about the natural enemies that will actually eat the eggs of um, the, this moth that turns into the worms. So that's one way to get them under control. Cutworms, there are several species of these and um, they tend to roll up into little tight seas um, and they da will damage young seedlings. And so uh, these live in the soil and um, will come out at night and feed. So one of the ways is to protect your young seedlings by taking um, a either a cardboard tube, like something from a paper towel or a toilet paper roll and um, half bury it to uh, produce a protective ring around your seedlings so that the, these um, cutworms don't get to them. Um, BT spray is also effective in taking care of these critters. Spittlebugs. Now, spittlebugs are, tend to be more annoying than anything else. Um, I, I don't know about you, but uh, my rosemary tends to get spittlebugs um, around this time of year. Um, these are little frog hopper nymphs that uh, secrete the spittle to hide from their predators. Um, there's, they don't produce really serious damage, but um, they can distort leaves. And really all, all I do is wash them off with a hose and usually within a month or so they're gone. So those are the top um, bad guys. And Sharon, I'm gonna let you go ahead and talk about the good guys. Thank you, uh, uh, Eliana. Um, 
Yeah, I think I, I drew the uh, long straw in this talk because I get the, have the privilege of talking about the good news in the insect world. Um, we've uh, got three categories of good bugs that we're going to talk about today. The three Ps here represented by these, these photos, uh, predis, uh, predators, parasitoids, or sometimes called parasitic wasps and flies, and pollinators. And before we go to the next slide, I'm just going to very briefly um, tell you what the difference is between those. The first two categories, predators and parasitoids, are um, natural enemies, uh, beneficial bugs of pest, uh, natural enemies, as I said, of pest, in pest insects, pardon me. Uh, predators eat other insects and mites. Parasites uh, include a number of wasps and flies and they lay their eggs in or around the host insect. Um, and pollinators, lastly, are beneficial primarily because they fertilize plants, allowing them to produce fruit, vegetable, and seeds. So next slide, predators. Here we've got uh, sort of a, on the top photo, the uh, poster child of the good bug, the lady beetle or ladybug. Um, who is uh, a, a, a voracious and helpful eater of aphids. Um, and on the bottom, there is a, uh, an assassin bug that is uh, um, attacking, I think that's a cat, is that a, I can't recall what, what bug that is, and it looks a little bit uh, hard to identify there. Um, Predators are either going to chew their prey with their mandibles, like the ladybug is doing, or they uh, pierce uh, the, uh, the uh, insect that's their prey and suck the contents of the body out. Um, in the case of the assassin bug, uh, down below there, um, it actually inserts venom into its prey um, to kill it uh, first. So we've also got ground beetles, predatory bugs, wasps, lace wings, and spiders in that, that category that we're gonna talk about. Um, the next slide, lady beetles. Um, there are very many uh, different species of lady beetles. The convergent lady beetle is most common in our area. And that um, top photo uh, was taken of a lady beetle in Palo Alto. And you can see that that lady beetle does not have spots. Um, so that's not always the case that they're red with black spots. Below that is a photo uh, from the Pinnacles National Park of lady beetles, the convergent lady beetles overwintering. They overwinter in the foothills of the Sierras and then in the springtime, they wake up and come down the coast. Now they feed on a variety, uh, mo most ladies bugs I should say, uh, feed on a variety of insects, aphids, mealybugs, etc. And we've got listed here, but not all. And this next slide is pretty helpful, um, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, these ladybugs are specialists. Um, as the name suggests, for instance, the mealybug destroyer feeds on mealybugs. Similarly, the spider mite destroyer feeds on mites. The twice stab scales, Vidalia cottony cushion scale, it also demonstrates uh, the variety and coloration of lady beetles. So we have the spider mite destroyer is a solid black. The twice stab sort of has the inverse of the traditional, you know, red shell with black um, with black spots. Next, um, I think that lady beetles are certainly easy to identify because of their concave shape. Um, and as I said, there can be black, red, with or without spots, oh, but by the way, uh, never green. If you see a lady beetle that's green with black spots, um, that is a Western spotted cucumber beetle and that's a pest. So you don't want that lady beetle around. Now this larvae, photo of the larvae uh, is probably a critter that we're less familiar with. Um, it's often called an aphid alligator and it is a voracious eater of pest bugs um, and will be found uh, where there are aphids and insect eggs and, and uh, beetle larvae. So if you happen to see this larva, don't, don't squish them, don't brush them off and leave him on your plants. Next, in the beetle family, 
we have the predaceous ground beetle. Uh, you've probably seen these in your soil. You see them under mulch frequently and they feed on soil uh, based larvae, snails and slugs. Um, and they break down organic matter as well. Underneath that, this, I think, handsome fellow, this soldier beetle that's red and black, um, I see in my garden very frequently. Um, it's, it eats uh, uh, a variety of aphids, eggs, eggs of beetles and moths, and, um, but it often eats pollen too. So I see it on my roses, um, going for the pollen and on his way, uh, I hope he takes care of some of those aphids. Next. Now, while some of these good bugs might not be very pretty, um, on the other hand, some are very beautiful. And in this case, the lacewing is a really beautiful, delicate uh, bug. It, uh, the adult is only sometimes uh, predaceous in some species, not always, but always the larva. That's the second picture down is predaceous in, in all species. And they take care of a big variety of pest bugs. Um, I don't know if you can tell from that picture, it's a little bit small, but it has like kind of like ice pick mandibles that uh, capture the, uh, the soft bodied insect. And the eggs are especially beautiful and unique. Uh, they're oval shaped. The very bottom picture is a picture of the egg and it has this very fine silk-like stem that attaches to uh, a plant. And sometimes they're single and sometimes they're in, in um, large quantities. Um, the lace wings fly at night. So if you have an outdoor light, you might see in the morning some of the dead ones down below that light. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen them already, that'd be a good way to identify them. And then the next uh, in, uh, insect we're gonna talk about is the surfid fly or hoverfly. It's, it's called the hoverfly because it kind of has a helicopter um, type of uh, flying um, motion. And uh, the adults of this stingless, stingless fly um, are frequently seen around flowers in our gardens. Um, it's often confused with a, honey bee, with a honeybee for obvious reasons because of its uh, yellow and black uh, stripes. Now the adult is a pollinator, not a predator, but the larva, which is the second picture below the adult, um, is a predator. It can be distinguished from a caterpillar because it's got that pointy mouth part uh, that is uh, piercing and attacks uh, its prey. Um, it doesn't have legs, so it's actually a maggot, um, not a caterpillar. And it's got translucent body. You can see some of the internal organs through that. They can eat hundreds of aphids in a month. And the, another group of uh, predatory uh, insects are the true bug category. Now, th there are probably some experts say 50 to 80,000 different kinds of true bugs. Um, but within that category, there are five good bugs. Unfortunately, the others in that category are generally plant eaters and they're not the ones that you want. The uh, assassin bug we've mentioned already um, that uh, uses, uh, attacks its uh, prey with venom um, and then consumes it. The big eyed bug with uh, big eyes on the side of its face is um, that's a pretty small bug. And so it um, preys on smaller um, insects, uh, especially caterpillar eggs, uh, small caterpillars, flea beetles and the like. Next, we have um, the damsel bug, which is very common on tree and rope plants. Um, the back of its body has little lines that kind of look like ruffles, like a ruffled skirt. And I guess that's how it got its common name of damsel bug. And below that, the minute pirate bug, as the name suggests, is a very tiny bug. It's going to be hard to see. It's probably only an eighth of an of a, uh, inch, but it is a, a, a preys on small um, eggs, insect eggs, and then the tiny insects and mites. And finally, we have uh, the uh, spiny or soldier stink bug. Um, a lot of this, this is really the only good stink bug. Uh, 
he can be distinguished from the bad guys. And over on the right, um, there's the marmor brown marmorated stink bug, which is a really big problem in ag and in home gardens in the east. It's, it's invasive. Um, but the good guy, we can tell because his shoulders have spikes on them. So I guess it kind of reminds people of an armored uh, soldier. Um, and uh, this, this good guy eats small insects, insect eggs, and I can see him in that photo is uh, attacking a caterpillar. And another category, spiders. Now I know a lot of folks are find spiders to be kind of creepy. Some people are even afraid of spiders, but really if spiders in your garden are nothing to worry about, um, it's a sign of a healthy garden. There are not very many uh, spiders, especially not spiders that are active during the, the day that during the day that can harm humans. Um, the black widow spider usually hides under logs or in dark corners of a garage and, and they don't come out into your garden. So uh, when you see those spiders in the garden, no worry. Uh, in, at my house, I love them to be out there. I don't love them inside my house. I, take care of them if they trespass, but if they agree to stay in the garden, it's fine by me. And the next slide. Oh yeah, um, now we had um, uh, thought to um, take a little bit of a break and thought you would enjoy seeing some video of these predators in action. Um, there you see has a great uh, video that we're gonna share with you, it's brief showing uh, both these, some of these predators and some of the parasitoids we're gonna talk about next, um, uh, taking care of uh, those aphids that uh, can be so annoying in our garden. Do you have lots of aphids in your garden? If you do, look very closely and you may also find beneficial insects feeding on them. Lady beetles are voracious aphid feeders. Most people recognize adult lady beetles, but lady beetle larvae, which are unfamiliar to many people, also stalk and eat aphids. These tiny black lady beetles just hatched out of their eggs. They'll soon be off to hunt aphids. Another common aphid predator is the green lacewing. Adults have lacy green wings and golden eyes. They lay eggs on long stalks either singly or in clusters. Lacewing larvae are the primary predatory stage. Larvae are alligator-like insects that grab aphids with their pincher-like mandibles and suck out the aphids' contents. In addition to aphids, lacewings feed on many other small soft-bodied insects, such as scales, caterpillars, and psyllids. Surfid flies, sometimes called flower flies or hoverflies, feed on pollen and nectar. However, surfid fly larvae feed almost entirely on aphids. These pale, legless, caterpillar-like maggots are often found wandering in aphid colonies, seizing aphids and scarfing them up as they go. Many other predators also feed on aphids. Soldier beetles are very common aphid predators on flowering plants. Damselbugs feed on aphids, as well as many other small to medium-sized insects. Predaceous midges are very small maggots similar to surfids that can often be found feeding on aphids. In addition to these aphid predators or hunters, many tiny wasps kill and parasitize aphids by laying their eggs inside the aphid's body. Eggs hatch into wasp larvae that feed within the aphid and rapidly kill it. The dead aphid develops a beige or black crust called a mummy, and the wasp pupates within, cutting a circular hole when it is ready to emerge as an adult wasp. Parasitic wasps and aphid predators frequently keep aphid populations at low levels. Protect these natural enemies by avoiding sprays and insecticides that will kill them. See the UC IPM website for more information on aphids and natural enemies. Well, I hope you enjoyed um, seeing that video as much as I do. I, I always uh, get a little bit of pleasure in seeing, uh, seeing our, those good guys take care of the aphids. Um, it's a pretty uh, fascinating, actually, um, uh, what nature can do to keep a balance. Um, next, we're going to talk about parasitoids, well, or parasitic wasps and flies. Uh, parasitoids are, are all in the category of wasps and, excuse me, wasps and flies. Um, they are uh, 
usually tiny and they're stingless wasps. So these are not the wasps that we commonly uh, recognize in our backyard. In fact, we probably have a hard time seeing them more see the effect of their, um, their activity. So parasitoids are defined as um, an insect whose larvae live as a parasite inside a host and eventually kill the host. Uh, usually they're the, either the same size or smaller than the host. The second picture, the top is a wasp. The uh, second picture there was a, of a um, uh, tachinid fly and we'll talk about him later. Next. There are hundreds of uh, species of parasitic wasps. And we can go through this quickly because you've gotten a preview in that video. This is the same wasp that we saw in the video um, make it, um, mummifying an aphid. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, and I mentioned uh, the tachinid flies. Uh, the middle picture is uh, the, a picture of that fly that you, is pretty common in our um, home gardens. He will look like a house fly, except that it has uh, very stout bristles on the back of its body. Now, depending on the species, uh, the tachinid fly, well, as well as different species of, of uh, wasps too, will deposit their eggs either in, on, or around uh, the host or the prey. Uh, the top picture, you can see eggs that have kind of been glued to uh, the larvae. And after those eggs hatch, they'll penetrate the body of the larvae and uh, consume the inside and then pupate. Um, the picture at the bottom is a cabbage looper and those black dots um, are the areas that the uh, fly has deposited its, its eggs inside, uh, inside the looper. And then the larvae develop inside and ultimately uh, kill their prey. So, the next category, our third P, are pollinators. And I think you've all probably heard a lot about the importance of pollinators, especially as honeybee populations um, and monarch fly, uh, monarch uh, butterfly populations are somewhat at risk. Pollinators are really important in our garden for a variety of reasons. First of all, there are some vegetables that absolutely require insects for pollination, uh, pollinization. Uh, crops like squash, broccoli, a lot of tree fruits, uh, blueberries, um, wouldn't have any fruit if it weren't for insect pollinators. Even in cases where some fruit is produced, the quality and the quantity of that uh, fruit is improved by pollination. Um, the representation of those strawberries show the difference between um, a strawberry with adequate pollination, pollinization and those without. And then in addition, it, they provide food, as we've said, for some of the adult beneficials, um, even though those beneficials it, might not be predators themselves, it's their juveniles that have to be in the garden if we're going to have those beneficials. Here are some beautiful pictures of a uh, caterpillar and butterfly. Um, a, a butterfly can be at one stage, a pest, that's when it's in the caterpillar stage, and then the other stage, a pollinator. And um, these beautiful pictures were taken by um, Eliana. And Eliana, um, I wonder if you would like to tell us about uh, this visitor to your garden and what you did about him. So I was out in the garden checking my parsley and my herbs and noticed that there was a bunch of the parsley that had no leaves. All it was was stems sticking up without any leaves on them. And I said, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. And I looked a little further and found this beautiful caterpillar um, who was the culprit of all of the um, gone parsley leaves. And so I went to take a look and identified the, this caterpillar as being the swallowtail caterpillar and thought to myself, well, I certainly don't want to uh, get rid of this, this particular pest. 
um, in the one sense because it turns into a, a, a beautiful butterfly and becomes a pollinator in my garden. So I decided to go ahead and let uh, these little caterpillars, and there were like two or three of them that I saw, uh, be in my garden and I shared my parsley with them. I figured I had enough parsley to share so that the butterflies could um, continue to live in my garden. And so, yeah, live and let live. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So I think the fabulous addition to the garden and worth giving up a little parsley for. Absolutely. Yeah. Next, we talked about um, uh, pollinators. Um, and just to uh, recall that we have many native species of bees. Um, the honeybee, while very important and produces honey, um, is, is not a native, it's from Europe, but uh, many various bees um, provide that pollination activity in our garden. And it's important to um, not spray insecticide uh, during the times that these bees would be feeding on the pollen of uh, uh, of the plants in our gardens. Next. More pictures of beautiful pollinators and uh, caterpillars turning into uh, pollinators. Um, again, in the news, I think you've heard a lot about uh, the decrease in populations of the monarch caterpillar. It's very dramatic. So I would encourage everyone to think of planting um, some milkweed in their garden to provide food for the caterpillar and hope that uh, we can help a little bit in increasing those populations. Uh, would point out the photo that is on the right at the bottom. It's a little hard to see, but there's a picture of a chrysalis attached to that tree of a monarch uh, butterfly pupating there. Um, I would love to, I found the caterpillars in my garden, but I haven't always found the chrysalis. Um, so sometimes I'm, I'm hoping that they're hiding away somewhere, but uh, developing, but they do have um, predators that attack the, them as well. So next, um, again, just more photos. We've talked about the surfeit fly and its benefits as a pollinator, wasps, other insects such as moths, and beetles are also pollinators. So a variety of plants in the garden benefits keeping those pollinators among us. And next, uh, um, Eliana is going to give us some tips that will uh, encourage these beneficials to come into our gardens. And so uh, Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so we wanna invite the good bugs into our gardens and um, in order to do that, we want to create pollinator habitats and butterfly gardens and uh, plant a variety of plants, especially flowering plants and those with open flowers that allow uh, the pollinators to be uh, present in our garden. Um, reduce the weeds um, and dead and infected plants because those can attract uh, bad bugs. But then at the same time, we want to tolerate some bad bugs so that the good ones stay. That's, that's the balance of nature that we want to try and create. Um, and so it's really a, a balancing act in some ways. Now, some, you know, some pests will overwinter in plant debris. So that's another reason for being sure to keep um, the weeds and dead and infected plants uh, or down as much as possible in your garden. Uh, keep ants out of infested plants um, and try to do your best to use non-chemical methods of control first. You can intersperse your vegetables and your annuals. Uh, if, you if you have a love of annual flowering plants, why not uh, intersperse them amongst your veggies so that the two can benefit from each other? We want to, uh, uh, I do my best to try and plant herb gardens because herb gardens do attract um, pollinators and good bugs. And you want to let some of your uh, plants and salads and herbs go to, go to seed and go to bloom. These, these definitely will help to, um, to uh, attract good bugs to your garden. 
So next we're gonna talk a little bit about IPM. Sharon? Thank you. We're not going to be able to go over this in huge depth, but, depth, but it's so important. Um, and the, what we're talking about today uh, in more detail is a piece of IPM. IPM uh, stands for Integrated Pest Management. And we'll give you a definition, some strategies, and then talk a little bit more about biological control. So here we have the definition of integrated pest management. I know you can read it for yourself, but integrated, it means that we integrate, well, that we use a variety of techniques to achieve our goals, uh, being very conscious of the ecosystem, uh, focusing on long-term prevention, not just uh, quick fixes, and um, management rather than absolute elimination of pests. This uh, graphic, this IPM pyramid is sort of a handy way uh, to, to think about IPM. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid is prevention. And as we move up, there's the physical, mechanical, non-chemical things we can do, then the biological control, some of which we've talked about today. And finally, small at the top of the pyramid is the chemical um, aspect in that. And you always wanna start at the bottom of the pyramid in assessing what techniques you're gonna use in your garden. Um, IPM asks the, the gardener, and actually uh, it's used very much in agriculture too, uh, to make informed choices about the techniques that they're going to use, using those that are most effective but least uh, negatively impactful to the environment. So starting with prevention, I mean, that's the best thing you can do for your garden. If you prevent pests, you for prevent bugs, uh, you have a lot less work to do with and still a beautiful garden. Resistant cultivars, um, healthy plants, um, just removing, as we've already talked about, dead and infested uh, uh, plants. Um, and then uh, uh, putting the right, the, the, the right plant in the right place. Um, knowing what the plant needs and taking care of its needs is going to yield you a healthy plant. Resistant plants and healthy plants are much less susceptible to pests and can recover. Or even if they have pests, it's not going to be devastating to them. You're still going to yield a satisfactory crop from your veggie garden. Um, next, um, we can move on to when, when all that fails or isn't just isn't adequate for your uh, goals. Moving up the pyramid, there are non-chemical, cultural, mechanical, and environmental strategies. We talked a little bit about Tanglefoot, uh, a, a mechanical way of keeping ants uh, off of your, your uh, plants. Uh, there's crop rotation where you, a, 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 the new season, you put a different plant in that location so that you don't have pests of a particular plant overwintering and then get ready to attack your, your plant the next uh, season. There are um, covers that you can put over your uh, vegetables that will keep out pests, uh, sticky barriers, other kinds of trap, uh, uh, other kinds of traps. And then uh, the next level is um, the biological control. So uh, we, we've talked about the use of natural enemies to reduce damage. Um, uh, biological control is not going to wipe out the pests. Obviously to keep the beneficials in your garden, you have to have some food for them. So you have to have a some tolerance for pests in your garden. Um, I will um, note, and, and some of you may have used this uh, before, that you can purchase uh, lady beetles, lace wings, and online you can purchase wasp eggs and, and all kinds of things um, to add to your garden that would be part of biological control. Um, it's, it, it's pretty challenging in a small home garden to have, especially ladybugs, to have them stay. They naturally disperse. And especially after they come out of dormancy, their instinct is to disperse widely. Uh, so I personally would recommend trying to create that environment that the, that the uh, beneficials that are there are gonna stay in your garden. 
uh, rather than adding them, they might be more appropriate uh, for, uh, you know, for greenhouses and that kind of thing. Um, um, Eliana, I know you've, you have uh, used ladybugs, haven't you purchased ladybugs to add to your garden? Um, I, I, how, how has that worked for you? It, it hasn't really worked for me because of exactly what you're talking about. I purchased a, a, a bunch of lady beetles from a, a nursery and um, followed the directions, put them out, um, you know, at night when they'd be least likely to um, disperse, um, they pretty much went away. And I think part of it too was that there wasn't a lot of food for them to eat around my garden at the time. But uh, lately, surprisingly, I've been finding lady beetles in my garden and I'm so happy because those are ones that have been there uh, or, or coming to the garden um, just naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, um, Eliana, it's uh, your turn now to talk about chemical um, controls. Great, thank you. So chemical control, um, in the definition of IPM, we only use chemical control uh, when monitoring uh, says that uh, everything else has been exhausted in terms of treatment. Uh, the goal of treatment in this particular case is just to deal with um, the target organism um, and that pest control materials or chemicals are used in such a way as to minimize the risk to human health um, and to beneficials and non-target organisms and to the environment. Um, we, we don't want to use a lot of chemicals because of, of several reasons. And one is that it can, and especially broad spectrum chemicals uh, can uh, kill beneficials as well. And another reason for not using chemicals is that uh, resistance can be built up and cause uh, super pests to resurge in larger numbers. And then of course the residues that remain on edibles and in the water uh, certainly is something that we don't want to have to deal with. So use the least toxic method uh, as possible when non-chemical methods fail. We recommend horticultural sprays and oils um, and insecticidal soaps that are least harmful to people in the past. And as always use um, insecticides uh, only as directed and read and follow the directions. That's super, super important. You wanna take care to protect yourself um, as well when you're using insecticides, using gloves and eye protection. So you want to really be very careful when you're using chemicals. Sharon, you want to share about this? Yeah. Well, this, recently, um, this came up that uh, the UC IPM, is, this is very timely to our talk, is going to have a free webinar uh, open to the public on April 15th that will um, show you how to navigate the UC IPM website. Uh, the UC, the uh, UC IPM website is a really rich and helpful uh, tool for any home gardener. Um, and we don't have the time here to, we'd like to, but to take you through all the, the great tools and the great information you can find online. But um, fortunately, they're going to have a full hour to uh, take you through where you can find solutions to your home garden problems and how you can think about um, taking care of your garden in a, in a healthy, environmentally friendly way. So April 15th, one o'clock to two, if you go to the website, ipmucanr.edu, you can register. And, and I like to say, hey, take advantage because um, these are wonderful scientists. There is part of your tax dollars uh, in action and uh, benefit from the wonderful work that they do. Great, thank you, Sharon. And um, before we wrap up, I want to just emphasize that as part of this presentation, we have a whole slew of resources listed on this presentation for you to um, avail yourself of um, all sorts of resources in identifying pests and promotion of native plants, IPM, a lot more. 
Um, and then we want to leave you with this one thought. Um, you know, humans are, are direct competitors with garden pests for the same food source. And if you think about it that way, um, you know, how much damage from pests are you willing to tolerate in your garden? Are you willing to tolerate none, uh, some, or a lot? And uh, depending on your answer, uh, the time that you spend controlling pests will be inversely related to your tolerance level of those pests. So. Um, Thank you very much. And we'll open it up for questions at this point. Hi, I'm Catherine Frazier, the chat monitor. So there's a few questions here. Cottony aphids, the, you know, looks like cotton balls sitting on your apple tree. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get rid of those and aphids, um, they're bad. So what do you do for those? Gosh. Well, I haven't had experience with the woolly apple aphid, um, not having fruit trees myself. Um, is it, it, are they, I don't know, uh, Eliana, if you have more experience with this, but um, does the water, shooting the water at it not work? Is it too high up in the canopy to knock them off? You know, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, my, my apple tree tends to have little apple worms that I tend to tolerate. Um, I've not had a lot of experience with the aphids on apple trees. So, but that is certainly something we can look into and- mm -hmm. We could, find yeah. yeah. The helpline would be really good in would. assisting with that. Are there any plants that actually attract or repel pests? Mm. I've heard marigolds have something yes. to do with and I think, it, you know, some gardens will grow marigolds because they'll attract um, the pests and the, they'll stay away from the veggie garden. Um, that seems to be a plant that, that tends to be grown a lot around veggies. Mm -hmm. Any others? I'm not aware of um, any research um, on the, on on that, and again, maybe with a helpline would be um, would be uh, a good source. Okay. One question a couple people brought up is how do you control leaf miners? <laughs> leaf miners is one that we didn't get to, huh? Hmm. Is that another helpline thing? Another, another helpline or need to need to go in and find out more information about how to control leaf miners. Okay. I don't know of any natural pests that, that deal with leaf miners. Yeah, you know, they're being inside the leaf that way that kind of uh, seems to, it would protect them. Um, boy, if you could catch it early on, I wonder if it would be uh, getting the infected leaves um, and dispose of them, but... Um, a lot of that kind of mechanical control is probably important to in observing your garden frequently and getting on it before it becomes a great problem. But yeah, I, I don't have any, any information specifically on that. Okay. Um, another question was about buying ladybugs or praying mantis and you'd already addressed it. Um, if perhaps maybe you can keep a tight netting around some of the mainly affected plants and let them go to town, uh, would you think it might be worth it then? Well, I just read something recently that um, an experiment that was done, now this is, doesn't have to do with netting, um, on roses and aphids. And they, they, in order to, one rose took two applications of 1500 ladybugs for the ladybugs to control the aphids on the roads. Now that's probably because they didn't have netting and so there was a, a dispersal of the uh, ladybugs, not enough of them stayed around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it kind of, de I, I mean, it de depends on the plant and whether it's healthy to put it have to be a fine netting um, that the ladybugs couldn't get through. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting thought. Um, 
a lot of people are talking about planting milkweed. And some of the comments were, don't buy the tropical milkweed because it's not beneficial. And only buy the kind that is in your area for native monarchs. And somebody mentioned the Yerba Buena nursery in Half Moon Bay was a good place to buy. And uh, somebody wanted to know about Portola Valley. There's some answers in the chat room on where you might wanna go uh, to look at many things if you are interested. But let's talk about some milkweed. Let's... Mm -hmm. my, my understanding is that the tropical milkweed, it's okay, it's okay except you have to cut it down um, in the winter because I'm trying to remember now, it does something. It, it's like a fungus or something like that as it overwinters that is detrimental to the monarch. Not that you can't have it at all, but you, you should cut it back so it doesn't overwinter. And I have both uh, the native in my garden and I have do have the tropical and um, I, I, I cut it down in the winter, but I am the tropical. I've had monarch caterpillars all over, all over it. Uh, so does anybody else uh, have a, have a mm -hmm. comment on that or an understanding of that? No, I don't see any more. Um, somebody mm -hmm. is talking a, about another plant that could help you is calendula. Besides marigolds, you use those or heard about that? Hmm. That's interesting. The, and the calendulas are, are actually kind of weeds in my garden. They grow all over. I like to have them in my garden, but I think of them yeah, in terms that. of pollinators, not in terms of attractants or repellents. Okay. Huh. I mean, Somebody else mentioned that um, leaf miners don't really cause major damage to a plant. Is that true? In my experience, it's true. I have a, a citrus tree that I was thinking of it being a poster child for every insect I can think of and a lot of leaf miners, but I still have loads of lemons. So I actually have a lot of different pests on that on that tree, but it it, it just doesn't bother me that much because, um, you know, it's not going to win an award at the, the at the state fair, but I it does for me what I need it to do. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's lots of leaf miners and it's still thriving. Okay, I guess it depends on the plant. I guess yeah. right. Let's see. What about coffee grounds and eggshells to deter snails and slugs? I've heard that a lot. I you know it. There, there are a lot of things that might work, but they haven't actually tested scientifically, you know? So it, has it, there really been a big study with control and all that, whether that works? My, uh, my thought would be that eggshells would be like diatomaceous earth, anything real scratchy, it, it, those uh, could control. Um, slugs and snails because it'll it'll cut through their uh, soft bodies. Right. Um, so I coffee. I I don't know what the yeah I, what's the the thought of that is. Okay. Uh, and what about copper? You hear of, of copper tape being used to prevent that? Um, yeah, I suppose to kind of create kind of a electrostatic uh, thing. Um, I've used it. I. It was easy. I put it around pots, the rims of pots. Um, so uh, I would think I would, it's reputed, you know, to work. Okay. And then I, we're running out of questions, but we'll ask this one and leave it at that. Are there any homemade insecticides that you recommend? Well, I, uh, Eliana, if you have something, I know I know people who do their own, um, you know, insecticidal soap with, um, you know, dishwashing liquid. Um, I did ask one of the UC Igor, I think, some time back. He said, you know, maybe maybe it works, but we just we just haven't studied it so that we they haven't invested the scientific time in what is the proper uh, uh, recipe. Um, at least at the time, this is probably a couple of years ago, 
that I talked to him because it sure would be cheaper to make your own. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, that was about it with the questions. Um, I would recommend that everybody look into the chat room and see some of the responses and the websites that are located there. But uh, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. And thank everyone here for attending our um, Good Bug, Bad Bug, fifth of the Spring Edible series presentations offered to you today by the UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Eliana and Sharon, thank you for your terrific information and excellent tips that you shared today. And if you have a question that wasn't answered, just email it to the helpline and a Master Gardener will respond. Helpline information, the copy of the presentation and the video link will be found on our UC Master Gardeners website. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming.